If you search online, you'll find any number of opinions on who the greatest rapper of all time is. People like Jay-Z, Andre 3000, Kendrick, some people probably even incorrectly say Drake. But I think almost every rapper who's ever been in that conversation was incredibly inspired by Rakim. Rakim was arguably the first person to really push the boundaries of what rapping could be and introduce complex lyrics and rhyme schemes to set hip hop on the path that we know today. So this is the story of Rakim, a person who should be in the conversation of the greatest rapper of all time, or at least the most important. If you end up enjoying this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe so you don't miss more stories like this from music history. I also have memberships open if you want to pay like three bucks a month and get early access to the videos, get shout outs in the videos, and get access to polls so you can vote on the next topic I cover. Ajax, do you think that's worth it? Apparently not. William Griffin Jr. was born in a suburb of Long Island in 1968. He grew up surrounded by music since he was the nephew of Ruth Brown, a legendary R&B singer. Rakim said about his aunt, quote, She let me know what to look out for and things of that nature, and I learned so much just from being her nephew and watching and being around her, end quote. Rakim also talked about how his mother sung a lot when he was growing up, and Eric B., Rakim's partner, talked about how Rakim's dad was like the coolest, smoothest person Eric had ever met. So as you might imagine, Rakim grew up being really interested in music. He even played in the school band. He said when hip hop came around, it all felt super natural to him. And he was really influenced by people like Melee Mel and Grandmaster Kaz. Those people who were a bit more laid back in their approach to rapping, unlike the Run DMC LL Cool J style that he called barking. He said he wrote his first rhyme when he was seven, something about Mickey Mouse. Originally, Rakim wanted to pursue professional sports. He played quarterback on his school's football team, and he was on his way to Stony Brook University to play college football. His coach even said he could start as a freshman there. But while he was working on his football, he was also writing rhymes and being really involved in the emerging hip-hop scene. Also in high school, he converted to Islam, which played an important role in the types of songs he wrote, and he changed his name to Rakim. Allah. Before going to Stony Brook, he went over to the house of one of his friends, DJ Maniac, and made a beat and rapped over it for basically an hour, which filled two sides of a cassette tape. He said, quote, back then you wrote until you got your point across, and that was my problem. I could never fully get my point across. He planned on bringing that tape to school, so whenever people started talking about rapping, he didn't even have to rhyme or be an MC. He could just put on his tape and show everyone that he was the best MC there, and that would allow him to focus more on football instead of having to prove that he was the best. Back in high school, his style was more upbeat and energetic, which was definitely the dominant style of the day, but it's not what Rakim is known for. He said that making that tape helped him experiment a little bit and try out this new style that became his signature. He said, quote, I think writing that song kind of created that style. I don't know if it was falling in love with that tempo, but writing that song kind of created the style. Then his friend and fellow teammate Alvin Tony knocked on his door and introduced him to a guy named Eric. At first, Rakim was a little bit upset because he told Alvin not to bring anyone to his house, but then, according to Rakim, Alvin said, quote, This guy knows Marley Marl and Mr. Magic. He wants to make a record. His name is Eric. End quote. Those two guys were some of the biggest names in the hip-hop scene at that point, so it got Rakim's attention. So Rakim put on that tape he made, and Eric was blown away by it. That's how Rakim first met Eric B. Eric B. was born in Queens in 1963, and he would start sneaking out to go to the hip-hop parties when he was around like 9 or 10. He also thought about pursuing being a pro athlete before music became his passion. He was a pretty good basketball player, but then he started DJing in junior high school by playing with his brother and friends at a roller rink, and it just kind of all snowballed from there. 
Eric was working at the radio station WBLS in New York City when he met Alvin Tony. Eric told Alvin that he was a DJ and looking for a rapper to team up with. Alvin first set up a meeting between Eric and a rapper out on Long Island known as Freddie Fox. He's also now known as Bumpy Knuckles. But Freddie was already a part of a group and Eric was only looking for one rapper, so Freddie thought it would kind of be turning his back on his group if he went and had a meeting with Eric, so he just blew it off. And that's what led Eric and Alvin to Rakim's door. So in 1985, the two formed a partnership and became Eric B. and Rakim. I will say that Wikipedia has a completely different story about how these two guys started working together. According to Wikipedia, Eric used to borrow records from Rakim's brother, so he would spend time in their basement learning how to spin, and that's kind of how the partnership blossomed a little bit. But they only have one source for that story, and when you follow the link to that source, the headline says, 29-year-old woman, military vet, and father of three beats 13-year-old girl in skateboarding competition. So... Yeah, maybe, maybe somewhere in that story it talks about Eric B. and Rakim, but I didn't read it, so let me know if you did. At first, Rakim wasn't sold at all on the whole rap thing. He still wanted to go to college and play football, so Eric B. told him that they could do it in such a way that Rakim wouldn't sign any contracts. He would be free to step back whenever he wanted. That's why that first album is Eric B. featuring Rakim on most of the songs. He later told Red Bull Music Academy, quote, But I stopped growing and the music did good, so maybe it's a good thing Eric B. knocked on the door. End quote. The two quickly fell under the tutelage of Marley Mall, but Rakim started to bristle a little bit against that leadership because Marley was pushing him in ways that Rakim didn't want to go and trying to change his style to mimic what other MCs were doing, and Rakim didn't want to do that. He wanted to be himself. Marley wanted him to be more energetic, that more barking style, but Rakim had found what he wanted to do, a more laid back and casual approach to it. He said that his style sounded more natural to him and that's what he wanted to go with. In 1986, they put out their first single, Eric B. for President, which caused a little bit of controversy because Marley claimed to be the producer while Eric said that he produced the whole thing and just paid Marley to be an engineer since he didn't know how to work all of that. Either way, it was a really solid showing for them. It was released on a tiny New York City label, but it did well enough to get the attention of some much larger labels, and it got them signed with a subsidiary of Island Records called 4th and Broadway. Marley still says that Eric B. for president sounds very sloppy and unfinished to him. He said, quote, One of the sloppiest cuts in hip-hop has to be Eric B. for president because we didn't finish the record, but the sloppiness of it makes it what it is. I thought we were putting pieces down to come back later and fix them. We're going to do the remix tomorrow, but put your ideas down now. But tomorrow never came. So with this new deal, they went to Powerplay Studios in New York to start working on their debut album. The way Rakim wrote his rhymes was by sitting in the studio, listening to the beat, and essentially freestyling his rhymes over that beat. Then he would stand up and record it by reading off of the paper. He said he wrote the entire album in under an hour while sitting in the studio, and that's why he kind of cringes a little bit at the lyrics now. Eric also admitted that the album was a bit rushed. He said, quote, The reason Paid in Full is so short is because we stood in the studio for damn near a week. The whole album came together in a week. Listen to the lyrics on it and listen to how short they are. That's because Rakim wrote it right there and we'd been in the studio for like a whole 48 hours trying to get the album finished, end quote. It got some mixed reviews when it was first released, but now it's largely seen as one of the best and most important albums in the history of hip hop. It did hit the top 10 in the R&B and hip hop charts, which led to them signing a record with Uni Records, which was a subsidiary of MCA. That album is largely seen as a massive step forward in terms of hip-hop lyricism. He was doing internal rhymes and polysyllabic structures within his rhymes, stuff that no other MC was doing. Before Rakim and Paid in Full, everything sounded pretty basic. Paid in Full gave hip-hop an entirely new complexity and set the blueprint for what rapping was going to be moving forward. As Eminem said, quote, he did something that hadn't even been thought of yet. He single-handedly pushed the genre forward to be more complex lyrically. End quote. Rakim said that what motivated him to write differently than all the other rappers at that point was his desire to not be constrained by the paper. He wanted to finish his thoughts and write a good rhyme, even if it didn't fit with what people were expecting. He took a lot of inspiration from how John Coltrane played the saxophone because Rakim was also a saxophone player, and he said that John Coltrane sometimes would never repeat a melody in one of his songs. 
and Rakim decided to never repeat a melody in his songs either. Keep in mind that Rakim is still in high school at this point, and they kept having to sign him out of school to do shows, especially when they toured out of town, so eventually he decided to just drop out of high school to focus on rapping. He had the idea that he could always go back if things didn't work out, but he still hasn't gone back. They released their second album, Follow the Leader, in 1988, and it featured a lot of instrument contributions from Rakim's brother. I think this is the album where Eric B. really got to shine. Of course, Rakim is Rakim, and he's going to do what he does, but Eric's work on this album is much more complex and impressive than it was on Paid in Full. The album was able to cross over outside of the R&B market, and it hit number 22 in the pop charts, spawning several really successful singles. Rakim talked about how important hip-hop was to him and to so many other people back then, he said, quote, You felt like you belonged to something. It just took over. It gave us discipline. It gave us a sense of pride. That's what it did for me. It helped me calm down and get to know myself, end quote. Eric B. on Rakim's next album, Let the Rhythm Hit Him in 1990, was kind of a disappointment to some people. After two incredible groundbreaking records, this one was kind of a letdown commercially. It was darker than people were used to. Some critics really loved it, but it didn't hit with the general public. They tried again in 1992 with Don't Sweat the Technique, which continued on a lot of the same stylistic themes of Let the Rhythm Hit Him. It was way more jazzy, and Rakim was a bit more aggressive than the older stuff. And it was, again, pretty strongly reviewed, but didn't do well commercially. After that, that album, Eric B. and Rakim's contract with MCA was up, and they both talked about potentially doing some solo work, but Eric maybe sensed that he wouldn't be as successful as a solo artist, so when it came time for them to sign their release from MCA, Eric refused to do it. Eric got a little bit scared that Rakim would leave him behind completely. Rakim said, quote, That caused the breakup of Eric B. and Rakim. Again, man, it was business. He felt that if he would have signed for some reason, I wasn't going to sign back to the last album. He felt I was going to cut him out for some reason. End quote. They both later stressed that they never had personal problems with each other. It was all business struggles. Rakim said, quote, We never had a fight before. I never swung at him. He never swung at me. It was never, never that. But it was just the business went bad, and there was a point at our career and in our life where there was a lot of things going on, and I think we just felt it was best to chill for a while. End quote. So the duo split up in not the best of ways, and it led to Rakim fighting many legal battles, both against Eric and their label MCA, which kept him not focused on rapping and his solo work for quite a while. For the first few years, he didn't really do anything, which led to him getting dropped by MCA in 1994. But he was able to sign a deal with Universal, and he released his debut solo LP called The 18th Letter in 1997, a full five years since people had heard from him. That album hit number four, and it was certified gold, so really not a bad showing. Rakim released one more album with Universal called The Master in 1999 that didn't do quite as well as The 18th Letter, since Rakim worked with a wide variety of producers and it just lacked cohesion. After that, Rakim signed with Dr. Dre's label Aftermath in 2000 and started working on a new album. Unfortunately, that album, which was originally called Oh My God, went through a lot of stylistic changes in the production process, which led to quite a few delays. In the meantime, Rakim featured on a lot of other Aftermath artist projects in order to get the hype up about his upcoming solo work. But then Dr. Dre and Rakim had a falling out, so Oh My God was never released. Rakim did get to keep those tracks that he worked on with Dr. Dre, and finally, in November, of 2009 released the seventh seal things had changed a lot in hip-hop between his last release and this one and rakim is never one to try and fit into what's popular he's going to do his own thing but that led to this album not really connecting with the wider public got pretty average reviews and it didn't sell all that well since then rakim has kept a pretty low profile he released a book he reunited with eric b and earlier this year in 2024 he released a new album called god's network rebirth Honestly, pretty good. It's very feature heavy, and I kind of wanted more just rock him in it, but he still sounds great. His rhymes are still great. He, I mean, it's still rock him. I think Jay Z summed up best why I think rock him should be at least in the conversation for greatest rapper of all time. Jay Z said, quote, He was rapping so far ahead of everyone else at the time that I don't think there's ever been a rapper with a bigger gap between himself and the competition. So that's the story of rock him. Let me know what you think about it. Let me know who your favorite rapper of all time is, who you think the greatest of all time is let me know if you like rakim let me know if i missed out on anything use the comments below for all of that fun stuff like the video subscribe before we get out of here i do want to point out something real quick a friend of mine released this comic called polar destroyer which is really great really cool stuff 
I mean, look at that artwork. Super cool. So if you're into comics, he's doing a Kickstarter right now to try and fund the second one. It's all independently done, which is cool too. So I'm going to leave a link to that in the description below if you want to follow along and maybe contribute to try and get more independent art out there.